Now, from CBS 4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Welcome to Facing South Florida. I'm Jim DeFeedy. You would think, following the Surfside tragedy and the deaths of 98 people, the Florida legislature would step in and make sure this didn't happen again. But you would be wrong, and later in the show, we will talk about why they failed to act. But we begin today with State Senator Manny Diaz Jr., a Republican who represents Hialeah. We talk about the culture war waged this year by him and other Republicans, but we started with reports that Diaz is in line to be the state's next education secretary. Have you spoken to the governor about it, and are you interested in the job? Well, there's been a lot of speculation, uh, Jim, and we've been honestly tied up with quite a busy session and and uh, and the budget, which is very important to our community. So haven't really had any conversations. Have, obviously, I have heard the speculation like everybody else. Um, we'll see what happens. And, and obviously, a situation like that with my career, I would uh, I'll, I'll obviously listen to, to anything like that because it's something I've done my entire career. But right now, it's just speculation and... Uh, we're still kind of uh, clearing the fog of war from the end of the session here. All right, well, let's talk about the session. Let's move to that. Um, how would you, big picture, how would you describe this year's session? I thought it was a session that was very active. Uh, it, it started off a little bit slow. It seemed that way that bills moved slowly. Uh, referencing to committees was kind of slow. Uh, but it got very active. And I think that uh, whenever you have maps mixed in, uh, every 10 years to a session, it, it brings a different twist. So you not only have the budget you're dealing with, you have maps that have to be passed. And then on top of that, you have legislation that works its way through the process. The governor has said he's going to veto the congressional maps. Uh, do you see it, the, session, the legislature coming back to take a vote on that or just at this point, just let the court sort it out? Well, look, it's clear that the governor intends to veto that bill when he gets it. Uh, whether we end up having to come back or get solved in the course, that, that's a question that's still up in the air. There's different viewpoints on that and how to, how to resolve an impasse when it comes to MAPS. Do you also envision a special session potentially on homeowners insurance rates? That's a very good possibility, Jim. And I'll tell you that uh, some of the information that uh, I have uh, gathered and researched since, you know, we've been going through this and, and, and this, is a, this is a crisis in our state, clearly, um, is, you know, digging into out-of-state, you know, uh, companies that have subsidiaries in Florida that started, on, that started under Charlie Chris, they're not capitalized. Then you have the reinsurance market, all these complex things that really the rate payers don't really care about. It's, it's mundane and boring to them. All they care about is how it affects their pocketbooks. And right now, I think we have a crisis with citizens continue to grow and the burden on the CAT fund and the government and policyholders and companies on the verge of going out of business, collapsing the market where there are no choices and rates are just going to continue to go up. Well, I think in the last couple of months, there were six insurance companies that announced they were pulling out of Florida. I think the insurance companies are posting... I think it was 1.5 billion in losses in 2020, 1.6 billion in 2021. I interviewed Je Senator, your colleague, Senator Jeff Brandis about this uh, just a week ago. Uh, it does seem like it's a crisis. So I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked him, which is, if this is a crisis, why wasn't this top of mind day one in the legislative session to deal with, rather than waiting until the last 48 hours to see if you could reach some sort of some sort of a bill between the House and Senate, and, and that just fell apart, as most things do in the last week. Yeah, well, there, there was clearly a bill and a, and a couple of efforts to get it done. Uh, it fell apart at the end of session because negotiations were still going on, but it was a bill that was moving through the process. In fact, two years in a row, the Senate had a bill that made major reforms, and last year it was amended at the end. We did pass a bill this year, there was more in there and they just couldn't reach agreement. There, there's gonna have to be a serious um, coming together of po finding possible solutions for this and we need to enact it. Now, what that looks like when it is, uh, we'll see what the decision is between the presiding officers and or the governor who can call us into session as well. Again, going harkening back to my conversation last week with Republican Senator Jeff Brandis, you know, he said that in part because so much of the session was taken up with these so-called red meat issues that it sort of sucked the air out of out of the place and so as so while you spent days 
arguing whether it was the so-called don't say gay bill, whether it was your bill, the Stop Woke Act, whether it was the abortion bill, all of these bills that were extremely contentious, the immigration bill, they seem to be solutions in search of a problem. Should, should the legislature have not gone into those areas and rather dealt with the things that actually affect homeowners and ratepayers here in Florida? Well, I think people uh, underestimate the amount of time that is available, even in the 60-day crunch. And the, the, those bills, none of those bills prevented the insurance bill from coming to the, to the forefront. What happened is there, what, there has to be agreement between the House and the Senate. And that regardless of what other bills are being discussed, if you don't have that agreement in, in negotiations, and there were there was uh, senators that were working on that bill as well as House members trying to come together, as, as well as the leadership uh, of both chambers, uh, it's not affected by any other bills that are taken up. That's that sounds like a, a point that makes a lot of sense, uh, Jim. But honestly, it doesn't really have an effect on the time. If you have a bill that you've negotiated and you can reach an agreement, there's plenty of time to do it. You go later into the night, or you come in earlier. So I, it's more about the fact that we need to find uh, agreement on a solution. I think everybody agrees that we need a solution, but finding what the agreement is on that solution has been a, uh, difficult to find we, because the House and the Senate have viewed it differently. I want to talk about testing and assessment because I know that was a major issue, but I just want to stay on this issue with some of these more contentious bills, particularly the parental rights bill, as it's called, but it's also referred to as the Don't Say Gay Bill by critics, Your Stop Woke Act, which, again, you say critical race theory isn't mentioned in there, but that was the impetus. Clearly, it was even discussed in the staff analysis. The immigration bill. These, these really did seem to be bills that, that were designed to divide people, not bring them together, that it was designed to excite the Republican base, not just state in the state, but nationally for the governor. Uh, and there were no real issues in Florida that needed to be addressed by any of those bills, were there? I disagree, Jim. I think that if you saw, you know, the parental right bill obviously uh, was with Senator Baxley, and it was a bill that he brought as a member bill. And if you look at the poll numbers, Jim, and you look at talk to people on the street, the man on the street, quote, uh, quote unquote, everybody agrees that kindergarten to third grade, those topics should not be brought up. They're, the kids are not mature enough. And the, there have been complaints about that. There have been parents that have conferred with concerns. And if it shouldn't happen and doesn't happen, then why are people so concerned and then put this label on the bill? Nothing in the bill talks about don't say anything, don't say gay. It talks about instruction. And I think we could all agree kindergarten kids five, six, and seven years old are not mature enough for that subject. I think everyone agrees with that. I, I, I don't think there's disagreement. I think the problem becomes that when you explicitly segregate out and say sexual identity and sexual orientation, then you're targeting a class of people and making them feel other and different. I think that became the issue. If it was just simply, and I think there were amendments on the floor to do this, to just say there should be no instruction on, on sexuality or on sex in K through three, I think it would have passed, you know, 40 to zero in the Senate. Uh, you know, so again, it, it, was the, it was the refusal to accept that, those types of amendments. It was the comments by Senator Baxley, the sponsor of the bill, who said that he's just uncomfortable with the number of young people coming out today as being gay that led critics to understand that this was really a bill designed to target the gay community and make them feel other and different. My yeah, I don't view it that way, Jim. I, I agree that there shouldn't be any conversation, and the bill probably could have started that way. But again, that was a, that was the sponsor of the bill, and I don't know, you know, if his personal comments reflect what's what's in the actual text of the bill. And that's what I've been saying since his first committee stop when I uh, when I saw it was I completely agree that we have to be very mindful of age appropriate material, and some when conversations take place. Um, could it could it be amended further to make it uh, clearer? I think it could. A any piece of legislation that you do will do that. But when you have these topics that create an emotional response and you get uh, it spirals out of control by getting a title like don't say gay, which is not in the bill, I think it, it hurts the process. But again, it happens sometimes. Let's turn to let's talk about school assessments, because I know this is an important area for you. Uh, the governor signed the bill this week. Talk to me about what is different now as a result of the school assessment, the testing component that takes place in schools. What changes 
and why is it important? Well, number one, I think I, I, one of my main points of this is it, it brings our technology, our, our assessment system up to the technology that's available in the 21st century. And while doing paper pencil has, has worked, especially in, in the elementary grades, in order to have the information and feedback come back and be useful, Jim, you have to have it immediately. It, it doesn't work for us to have a test at the end of the year, students out of that classroom already with a different teacher, and then you get this data back. How do you use that data? So that what this does is provide benchmarks at the beginning of the year, which really is a formative assessment. It informs instruction. Same thing in the middle of the year, and then a summative exam. But the technology will assist us in cutting down student testing time in, in those, and it cut down the testing windows. Instead of needing three or four weeks, you may only need two because of the technology and the ability to get this feedback. So it does reduce testing time. The hopes is, is going forward that it becomes adaptive. And what that means is that students master components, it reduces the amount of, of testing that they have to do at the end of the year. So I do think this is gonna move in a direction where it does cut down total testing time and the aspirational goal of a 75% cut of testing time. But at the same time, it's also gonna be more productive for our teachers and for our parents to know what's going on. No, I agree. It, th it seems to make a lot of sense that if you take, if a, if a student takes a test, to not be able to use the results of that test in a meaningful way to help that student during the course of the year, it, then it seems rather pointless. And that's really what the bill is trying to get at, correct? That's exactly what the bill is trying to get at. And, and we tried to keep it at a 30,000 foot view because you have to allow uh, the Department of Education to, first of all, adjust their, their bids and their contracts to meet the requirements of the bill because there was another bill passed last year that dealt with the primary grades and progress monitoring. So now it has to be expanded to go uh, kindergarten through 10th grade to be able to have these assessments and these, uh, this feedback available for these students. When we come back, we turn to Surfside as I speak to State Representative Danny Perez about why the legislature failed to act. Stay with us. <laughs> 